Thank you for joining us. Here at BLC, our purpose is helping people discover and develop a life in Christ. Now here is Pastor Gary Tony. Well, I'm going to I'm going to need your help this morning. Michelle, thank you. I uh, I want to wrap this series up today. And so you're going to have to help me stay on point. Is that okay? Can we do that? <laughs> Why y'all laughing? Uh-uh. Uh. Well, let's dig right in cuz I really do have I, I I sent my message to Paula and she laughed at me. <clears throat> She's like, "Yeah, that ain't going to happen." I'm like, no, it's going to happen today. Y'all are going to help me, right? So let's get right into it. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Now, I trust that you are doing your homework. I had, there, there's some right there. A couple of you are, okay. Here, here. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Betty. Yeah, she did. Here, here's the thing, you all. If, if I'm not giving you homework just to be doing it. See, I know how, how it is as a believer. We listen to this guy on Monday. We listen to another podcast on Wednesday. And if we can, we squeeze in a little Bible here and there. We've got our own Bible study. We're doing our own thing. And so when the Lord wants to speak to you about something through me, if you've already got the seed in you and you're studying it, then when I say something about whatever it might be and you have questions, because so often I know you have questions. I encourage you, we get these little notebooks in the back so you can write down stuff. And I encourage you to write down questions. Don't think you've got it. I don't have it. And when you do, chances are the Holy Spirit is going to honor your faith. And so often what I've seen over my years as a pastor is, in my message, if you're listening, he'll answer your question. You don't have to wait and call me because if, you, if your heart is engaged with the Holy Spirit, if your faith is active, if you're listening with faith today, he will speak to your spirit. He will transform your soul. But you got to be, let me say it like this. It's time the church stops putting it all on the preacher. You didn't bring it today. No, chances are you didn't come get it. Just maybe. You can look in the mirror and, t uh, huh? Yeah. Now, if you, I mean, if, you, if it helps you to blame me, that's okay. I can handle it. I've, I've been blamed since I've been a pastor. But I want to encourage you today, come with this expectant heart that God, not Gary, but God is going to speak to you. Amen? Let's go. First Corinthians chapter 14. This is part of your homework that you've been reading. He says this in verse 1, pursue love. That means don't wait for love to come find you. Pursue it. And desire spiritual gifts. How many of you desire spiritual gifts? If you're not, I want you to. Well, I don't really know enough about it. That's okay. None of us know enough about it. But desire it. But why, why, why should you desire spiritual gifts? Because the Lord told you to desire spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. You all do understand the Bible is the word of God for you today, right? Desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Why? Because when you prophesy, you are, you are speaking an inspired utterance from the Lord over your life, over your situations. When the Holy Spirit prompts you to speak his word over your life, it's at that moment that you have the opportunity to speak inspired, to speak prophetically. I'm not talking one of the gifts of the Spirit prophetically. I'm talking about in the general sense of your born-again nature, you can speak like your father speaks. You all do understand you're children of God, right? Provided you're born again. Now, if you have not given your life to Jesus, then Satan is your God. Oh, no, Reverend, I would never worship Satan. I didn't say you worshiped him. You definitely follow him. Man, I just kicked a religious cow right there, Cody. Some people think, oh, no, I don't agree with that. Well, you can agree with that all you want. That doesn't make it not true. You're either of one kingdom or the other. There, are, there, is, <laughs> there is no gray area. There is no holding pattern. You're either born again or you're lost. You're of the kingdom of darkness or of the kingdom of light. 
And, it's, and we're not being critical if you're not born again. Our job is to give you the opportunity to fix that. And then once you do, here's the crazy thing. Andy, I know you've seen this, but when people get born again, it's, all of a sudden when you get born again, that's when the devil wants to highlight all your junk. Let you know, oh, well, you remember last week, you missed it there. God's not going to forgive you. You need to turn around on it. God's already forgiven me. Now, that being said, there is a day of judgment. Just because God has forgiven you, I need, you, I need this to be a wake-up call for you today. Don't think you can live however you want to live and ignore the Bible. My wife called me slugger. I, I said it with a smile, man. I mean, dang. But it is true. I, I know Christians that have given their, that have accepted Jesus as sacrifice, but him being Savior and him being Lord are two completely different things. I need you to wrap your head around that today. And it's not Savior you're going to stand in front of. It's Lord. Remember, he's coming back with fire in his eyes and a sword in his hand, and he will judge not only the church, but the world. See, too many of us today, unfortunately, we give very little attention to what we say. This, this, this talk is called Prophesy Your Life. Speak inspired, speak led of the Spirit of God because you're born again. You have the Spirit of God inside you. But what I've discovered in my own life as a pastor, but over my, my journey watching and, and dealing with people is this. We give very little attention to the power of our words. So I want to take a minute with this this morning <clears throat> because if you remember what the Apostle James says, he makes this statement. He says that we are like the rudder on a ship. We are to set the course of our life with our words. Now, if you go look at James chapter 3, he goes on to say this, that our words are like a little kindling that starts a forest fire. Now, you think about this. For, how many of you know what kindling is? Yeah. If, you, if you've ever started a fire, you don't just get the big log and hold a match to the big log. You go get some little sticks and twigs that are all dried out. That's called kindling. It's those little sticks that start the fire. That's James's point. It's the little things that you say that start the fires in your life. And James goes on to say that that fire is started by hell. I know some of y'all think, oh, I would never say what the devil says. <laughs> You're adorable. <laughs> Listen, he doesn't, need, he doesn't need to influence the world to talk like him. They're not a threat to his kingdom. You know I love you, right? He doesn't need the weekend warrior that just warms a pew. He doesn't have to waste any time with you because you're not going to talk like God. I know some of you are like, oh, no, yes, I, when? On Tuesday afternoon when the blankety-blank traffic cuts you off? Oh, praise Jesus. <laughs> it must be a crock pot in the floorboard. <laughs> huh? No, he's going to harass those that are endeavoring to seek God at a higher level, that are pursuing God at a higher level. But what I've discovered is we don't give thought to our words as children of God. Let me ask you something. You all know why the Bible says that God can't lie? Now think about it for a second. You do know the Bible says, I, God says, I am not a man. I cannot lie. You know why he says that? Not because it's some rule that he made. God's word is creative in its power. When God says something, it is. I know these walls are gray, but if he said, walls, I want you to be neon green then guess what they would be? See, our problem is we do not believe that our words carry the same creative power as our fathers do because we've stepped out in our baby form of spirituality and tried what our father has showed us to try, and we didn't see the same results that we see in Jesus' life, and we conclude, and unfortunately what makes it even worse and magnifies it is that preachers get up and preach that, well, it was different then. That was just for Jesus. Well, if it was just for Jesus, then why did Jesus lie? Because Jesus told us the things you see me do, if you believe it, you can do them. 
In the Great Commission in Matthew 28, he said, you go teach all the other disciples that you're training and everything I commanded you. Why would he do that if it was supposed to end with him? If he was just this special class of creative being? No. We are joint heirs with Christ. We are in Christ. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. In John 17, he said, Father, I pray that they be one, just as you and I are one. But the only way that takes place because of the power of free will is when transformation in your soul goes to work. And all of a sudden, you get revelation of who you are as a son or daughter of God. Not a religious person, not a member of Victory Life Church, but a member of the kingdom of heaven, part of the family of God. See, that's the thing, guys, as... As children of God, I need you to leave here with this today. If you don't get anything else, get this revelation. As children of God, you just can't say anything you want to say. Lord, I know your healing power works in my, in my body. Oh, you don't understand what I'm going through. Oh, I'm, I, oh I just can't. Oh, I try. Which one is it? If you're the heir of God and your tongue is the rudder of your mouth and it sets on fire a forest with a little kindling, those little words you're saying are... See, at the end of the day, you're going to have to make your mind up about something. You've got to believe this stuff. And I know we we like, oh, yeah, I know we're supposed to believe it. No, you don't know. If that's your approach, then you have no clue what believing is. Think about it for a second. Jesus said, all things are possible to him that goes to church on Sunday. What did he say? What do you got to do? Hebrews says, those who come to God must do an extra Bible study. No, what's it say? What do you got to do? The Apostle Paul says, in order for you to, to become a child of God, you must believe in your heart and say with your mouth. So whatever situation you have, whatever promise you have, whatever word that you're standing on, you need to make your mind up that no matter what you see, this is true. And then you say, you prophesy your life. I am what God says I am. All of my needs are met. I have an abundant supply to do everything that he's called me to do. Now, you don't have abundant supply to go to the gambling track. No, you don't have abundant supply to upgrade your 95-inch TV to a 115. N- nothing, now, nothing wrong with that. I don't know if they have a 115, but it'd be nice. <clears throat> Guys, learning things of the Spirit. You don't just flip a switch. It's a process. You are the clay on the potter's wheel and you have to stay there our problem is we get on the potter's wheel on Sunday for a few minutes and we jump back off on Monday who's shaping you then that's right Chad the world HBO Sports Center all the networks with the three initials Mm. you need to stay as far away from them as you can Now, they may have something good, like there's going to be a ball game on there today that I'm going to watch and enjoy, but I have commercial channels because I can't stand all the drug dealers on the commercial channels because all they're doing anymore is selling drugs. That's all they do. (laughs) Anyway, I told you all to help me stay focused. Go to Romans chapter 8. Let me show you something. Romans chapter, y'all doing okay so far? This is going to be a good day because I know we're going to get it. We're going to get her done. <laughs> Who was that? That was a comedian back in the day, wasn't it? Cable guy, yeah. I don't know where that came from. Watch this. Romans chapter 8, verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Now, I know some of your translations say children. I don't agree with that. We talked about translations last week. You have to, you have to be careful with that as a student of the Word. You are children, but it, he says sons on purpose here because he is pointing us to a, direction of, to a direction of maturity. You got me? See, those who are mature, those who are growing in the things of God, you're going to be the ones that are going to be more sensitive and be able to be led at a higher level in a human body by the Spirit of God. Can I give you an example of this? 
I, I need, to, I need to, to deal with y'all for a minute. A few weeks ago, I'm in Acts chapter 2, talking about the Holy Spirit and the birth of the church and how he came. And I was going over to your homework, and I was talking about the Apostle Paul starting the Corinthian church. And he started the Corinthian church on his third missionary trip when he was in, a, when he was in Ephesus, or, or when he, was, uh, or he started it on his second one. He wrote the letter in, on his third one in Ephesus. But I made the statement. I was all hyped up talking about the birth of the church. And I said, Paul started the church 50 years or started the church in Corinth 50 years after Acts chapter 2, after the birth of the church. But that's not true. Because he, if you, the, you know, he was, the book of Acts is when he started the church, okay? Paul dead in a few years later. It was 50 years after the birth of Christ, not the birth of the church. Now, you all know what I tell you around here, right? See, don't always, don't always think I got it all together and I'm going to say it all right. Y'all supposed to keep me in check on this stuff. Not one person called me on it. Pastor, you know it wasn't the birth of the church they started that. He started that after the birth of the 50 A.D. is after the birth of Christ, not the birth of the church. Now, now in my personal opinion, I think, the, I think the clock should have started after the resurrection, not after the birth, because it's a new covenant after he said it's finished. But that's, what's, that's what they did. So. But I just wanted to correct myself in front of y'all because y'all didn't correct me. Well, Pastor, am I supposed to? If I say something wrong, Yes. So y'all keep, remember, don't just assume I'm right. I'll mess up just like anybody else. But at least when I do, I'm going to own it. Huh? Okay? So when it comes, and, and, I'm set, and here's the thing I'm talking about, because I'm, I'm talking about being led by the Spirit. And I'm sitting there studying for my message this week, and I'm in the recliner just going through my notes and meditating on stuff. And the Lord said, by the way, now I don't mean, I, when I tell you all the Lord speaks to me, I'm not hearing words. You understand that? In my spirit. God doesn't need words. Thank you, Holy Spirit. God doesn't, see, I just heard him. God doesn't need words to communicate. He uses words to create. He doesn't need words to communicate because all y'all know that God's told you stuff and dealt with you about stuff, and you didn't hear a thing. But you knew it was the Lord, right? Yeah. So I'm studying, meditating. He says, by the way, Gary, you told him wrong a couple Sundays ago. Come on now. If you can't hear him tell you wrong, you <laughs> If all you want to hear is, yes, you're doing right, you do. Sometimes that might be the devil helping you. Yeah, yeah. See, when it comes to being spirit-led, see, I really believe we have to grow in this. And especially when it comes to operating in the gifts of the spirit, even understanding the gifts of the spirit. For example, there is the ability for a believer to practice inspired speaking, remember? Remember? But that's not the same thing as the manifestation of the Spirit that the Apostle Paul writes about in chapter 12 with the nine gifts. Not the same thing. I know I've heard people, they go, well, Pastor, you have the gift of speaking in tongues. No, I don't. Nobody has the gift. The gifts belong to the Holy Spirit. I'm going to show you today. You just stay with me, okay? See, when it comes to spiritual realities, you've got to pay attention to what's going on through the Word of God and the inspiration of the Spirit. And you have, to, you have to reverence those things. You remember what Jesus said, and you've heard me quote this many times. But Jesus said, guys, don't give what's holy to dogs. And then he said, don't cast your pearls at pigs. What's he talking about with that? See, when you begin to grow and you get revelation in the things of the Spirit and you begin, you begin to practice some of these, don't just go out anywhere and offer these things up. What are you saying, that I'm supposed to be a secret agent Christian? 100% no, I am not saying that. Everybody in your circle should know that you are a, ch a child of God. They should know that you are a believer. I was listening to a minister the other day, and one of his people came to me and said, said, Pastor, how long am I supposed to believe? He said, uh, you're a believer <laughs> forever. <laughs> right? It's like a human say, how long am I supposed to breathe? You are a believer. You're supposed to believe, right? And learning these things, being sensitive to the Spirit, boldly letting people know who you are, but rooted and grounded in the love. When it comes to spiritual realities, you have to be led in how you present them to people. You can't just go unload all your revelation on somebody in the break room because you'll be casting 
spiritual things. You'll, you'll be giving it to the dogs and casting it in front of pigs because they don't know what to do with it. You could take this Bible and you can give it to a pig and you can give a, uh, you know, whatever Bible, Harry Potter book. Well, the pig doesn't know any difference. That's Jesus' point. Be led when it comes to the things of God. Amen? Here's, Paul gives a perfect example of this. Let me, let me kind of help you with this a little bit. In Paul's letter to Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 6, he's dealing with this issue. And Paul makes this statement. He says, Timothy, there are, listen very carefully, and because I know some of you all have encountered people like this. Timothy, there are people who are inflated with themselves. He says they are obsessed with controversy over useless arguments. And in chapter 6, verse 5, Paul makes this bold statement. He says, from such people, turn away. What is he saying? He says, when you're out sharing the gospel and you're operating in your ministry and you encounter someone that all they want to do is argue and, and, and disagree with you, you're done. Don't waste your time casting your pearls in front of pigs. I remember one time I was in a conversation with a gentleman about the rapture. And as soon as I brought it up, he wanted to argue with me. And he got mad. And as soon as he did, I knew he wasn't listening to me. He's trying to prove his point. So I changed the conversation. He said, no, I want to talk about that. No, we're not talking about that anymore. You got your mind made up. Now, I, I did it in love, but he was, he was already mad at me, so it's not like I'm going to make him madder. I guess I could have, but I tell you, we're not going this way. I, 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 and then I took him to this scripture. I said, this is what Paul told Timothy. Don't get in arguments about this stuff. If your mind's made up, then you are unteachable, haughty, prideful. <laughs> yeah. So stay humble. Stay teachable. Why am I saying that? Because Paul goes into some very confusing stuff in your homework. Listen to him in chapter 12, verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts. Now, remember, we touched on this a few weeks ago. This word gifts is not in your modern translations because they missed it here. I know some of you think, Pastor, how can you say that these, these successful organizations that did a translation missed it because they don't have writings that date back to hundreds and hundreds of years that I'd, they don't line up with old school. And I'm not, I'm not a King James guy. I mean, I do use it quite often. I'm a new King James guy. And just so you know, new King James isn't a modern version of King James. It's a completely different translation that stands on its own. In my opinion, it is the best. But that's my opinion. There are several good ones, and you should use them all. And with the technologies that we have today, you can. And so when you see something that doesn't match, then question it. Why is it that in there? Yeah? That word gifts in, the, in, in your King James and New King James, it is italicized, which means it was put in by the translators, the writers. It's not in the original Greek language. Paul says concerning spirituals. He's talking about spiritual realities, brethren. I don't want you to be ignorant. Now, you all know what the root word of ignorant is? Ignore. And that's where most people that are ignorant become ignorant is because they ignore the truth about a matter and they come to the conclusion that they're right based on whatever somebody told them over tradition and that makes them ignorant. Now that's not an old slang derogatory term. There are people that are, I'm, I'm ignorant of things. When it comes to computers, I'm calling John in. I'm not even wasting five minutes trying to figure it out. I'm ignorant. See, some of y'all need to own your ignorance that you have. We're prideful people though. We won't. We'll go try all kinds of stuff, and we'll have the program all jacked up. Like, what'd you do? Well, I tried this, and I tried. Some of y'all got 12 Facebook accounts because you keep trying something. <laughs> Why did y'all laugh at that one? <laughs> We've done that junk, right? <laughs> Concerning spiritual gifts, spirituals, Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant. Now, let me set this up for you a little bit. Because Paul is writing, understand, Paul is writing this letter. The, the, the first Corinthian letter, which it actually wasn't the first one he wrote. If you go study first Corinthians, you'll see that he did write another one, but it got lost. But he's on his third missionary trip. He's in Ephesus, and he's already sent Timothy to go back to straighten these charismaniacs out because they are out of control. 
And he's got a whole group from the church, from the leadership team, that has come to Ephesus to talk about the craziness that's going on in their church services, and they've lost control of it. That's why Paul, listen to me very carefully, that's why Paul is writing this letter. Paul didn't know that... <clears throat> Paul didn't know that this letter was going to be inspired. He didn't know it was going to wind up in the holy canon of Scripture. He, as, as a bishop, as a, as a pastor, he's dealing with this church that he launched some eight, ten years ago. And he's straightening this stuff out. And the thing is, they in the church, they misunderstood as well as misused spiritual gifts in their church publicly. And they completely, they were overlooking the foundational needs of the people. They were operating with unselfish motives. I mean, they were getting up and interrupting each other with tongues and prophecies and different things happening in the church. And I mean, I'm sure it was, how many of you come out of some old school Pentecost? Let me see, put your hand up. I need to know I'm not by myself here. Some of y'all, y'all seen some of that stuff? Well, Pastor, I just couldn't help it. The Holy Spirit came up on me. Now. No, you could help it. You're just a little zealous. And that's what Paul was dealing with right here. He's got to give them some direction on how to yield to things in a public setting. Now, if you want to shandai, rondai, tie your bow tie by yourself and jump up and down in your living room, go on. See, some of you laughing. Some of you like, Reverend, that's not funny. Oh, no, it's a little funny. Yeah. Here's the thing. Remember Romans 8, them that are led by the Spirit of God? This is a revelation you need to get today. See, the Holy Spirit leads. He empowers. He doesn't overpower. I need you to get this today. The Holy Spirit empowers. He doesn't overpower. He will never make you do something. I know old school Pentecostals said that, but they said that out of zeal and out of confusion. He doesn't work that way. That's what Paul is dealing with in his letter here. He empowers, he doesn't overpower. I know some of you that come out of that stuff, you're like, well, I don't agree with you. Well, you got a Bible. Just go sit down and listen to Paul's letter. He will straighten you out. So what's this got to do with us today? Why is this such a big deal today? Because today, you all remember, I've talked about this a few times, you remember ditches? If you're driving in the country road, if you don't stay on the road, you're going to wind up in a ditch. And see, what took place with Paul's letter to the Corinthian church, they had wound up in a ditch. They were out of balance with how the spirit was flowing and how things were supposed to operate in a church. And they were confused with the, the gifts or the manifestations of the spirit and the natural operations of a born again that's spirit filled. Because they're two different things and they're blending it all together and it's confusion. So they're over in that ditch and Paul's bringing them back center. But unfortunately... In today's church, we've shifted to the other side, and now we're over in this ditch where we no longer even acknowledge it or talk about it. And we say absolutely ignorant things like it's of the devil. Now, now just humor me for a second. How many of you all have heard over your years that speaking in tongues is of the devil? Put your hand up and leave it up. For, look, look around the room. Now, where in the world did we get that... I almost said a bad word. Where did we get that stupid stuff? Where did we get that stupid stuff from? Right here. Preachers did it. No Bible to support it. No scriptural foundation of any kind, not to mention the foundation of love that we're supposed to walk in. Preachers get up because they... Where, wherever it was in their journey of faith, they tried to step out and try it one time, and they didn't see the same result that the book of Corinthians shows us. And so they concluded in all their intelligence and success and platform that, well, it must not be for today. No scripture to back it up. If you have no scripture to back it up, you know what needs to back up? You. Y'all okay? Because I think we need to come out of the ditch, and the church needs to have conversations about this, so that when somebody comes to you and they say, oh, you go over to Victory Life, you're that tongue talking church, you're like, yes, we are. Do you have questions? <laughs> Seriously, the reason that society is ignorant about the subject is because we don't talk about it, and we're in that ditch. My job is to get you back up on the road, get you out of the ditch, Yeah. I almost went, landed in a ditch last night. My truck smells like a skunk this morning. I, had, I went to my brother's. My brother turned 60. I went to his birthday party last night out in the country, and, and somebody in front of me hit a skunk. 
So praise the Lord, I didn't smash the thing. It had already been smashed. But you know when you first hit a skunk, it's beautiful aroma. (laughs) And so I had to swerve to miss it. But when you drive over one that's just allowing the aroma to, and your heater's on. (laughs) Yeah, I I smelled like skunk all night. Yeah. Huh? I got to get y'all back to the middle of the road. Amen. All right, were, are y'all in 1 Corinthians? Let me get there. Chapter 12, let's look at, uh, let's look at verse 4. Now, listen very carefully. Write your questions down, things like that. I appreciate you all. Bring, I'm, I'm hearing more and more pages turn. I love that you all are bringing Bibles and notebooks. We even have notebooks for you because it's things like this that the Holy Spirit will prompt you about something you need to write down. Because we, we're all growing in these things. But listen to Paul's words. Because he's, he's dealing with this issue in the church. He says, verse 4, There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. Say same Spirit. Verse 5, There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. Now the New King James uses the word ministries. The, the more traditional King James, they use the word administrations for that word right there. Verse 6, and there are diversities of activities, but it's the same God. And New King James uses activities. The original King James uses operations. What is Paul talking about? There are different gifts. There are different administrations or ministries. There are different activities or operations. And he says this, it's the same spirit. It's the same Lord. It's the same God. Notice that he highlights the Trinity there in this description. What, what, is, what is the Lord doing? He's the same in everything, and it's him that, that manifests these things. But in verse 7, Paul makes this interesting statement. And I love the word because th- this is the correct word right here that the New, King James, the New King James uses. But the manifestation of the Spirit, not a gift, a manifestation of the Spirit, it is given to each one for the profit of all. See, this is the thing I want you to understand about these gifts. I, I know out of Charismaniaville, people say, well, Pastor, I have the gift of healing. You may function in the gift of healing. You don't have it. It's not yours to have. Look at, ver- look at, look at verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit, of the Spirit, manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Verse 11, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing. Who's doing the distributing? The Holy Spirit is to each one individually as he wills. A manifestation goes as he wills. See, this is the thing, guys. These gifts, these manifestations, they aren't given to an individual in the sense of ownership where you can operate at it any time you want to. I've heard Catherine Kuhlman minister years ago, and, and uh, I've heard people teach on her, and she operated in the manifestation of miracles and the gifts of healing. And there'd be times that she would come out on the platform and she would just tell everybody, shh. And she, would, you know, she was so dramatic. And she would say, the Holy Spirit is here. I'm like, man. <laughs> and she would just quieten everybody. And she would say, just be quiet in his presence. And just like that, all over the room, thousands in the room, and they started getting healed. She didn't say a word. She didn't lay hands on anybody. The gift of the Holy Spirit was manifesting Yes, through her to a degree, but it was really, it, it was in a corporate setting in that reverent presence that the Holy Spirit began to flow. I know, like, man, I want that today. It doesn't come by wanting you all. There was, all, Amanda's reading this book, it's called God's Generals, it's old school, by Robert Slaird, and if you haven't seen it, you ought to get a hold of one of those, but it talks about all these old generals of God and the sacrifice that they did. But they flowed in gifts. This is the thing. It is, it is a foundational reality. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one. This is, you know, for the profit of all. But he does it as he wills. Now, we can't, <clears throat> and this is the thing that Paul is doing, we can't confuse, watch this very carefully, the ability of a believer <clears throat> to practice 
gifts that come with the Holy Spirit in your born-again nature with the manifestation of the spiritual gift. It's a completely different thing. For example, I can speak in tongues. And it's not a gift of the Holy Spirit coming on me. It is my spiritual language. I can prophesy in a general sense. And that, that's not operating in a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge. I'll get to those in a minute. See, there is the general walking of the Spirit, living by faith realities, and then there is the manifestation of the Spirit in a corporate setting as He wills. And there is a distinct difference. You can't make the Holy Spirit show up. You have to, I mean, there would be times in, in Kuhlman's meetings and in different ones, Brother Hagen, they would wait. They would worship. That was one of the big things they would do. They would worship. And they would wait. They would wait until the moving back in the old Pentecostal days when the Spirit gets to moving. Right? Those are real things, you all. Biblical things, not just crazy charismatic stuff. Let's keep going. Y'all okay? <clears throat> now let's go to verse, uh, verse 8. Now he's going to break these down. Let me go through this kind of quickly because i got a lot more to get to. Because let me, let me say this. There is a study guide. Will, I think you all did that. The, spirit, the, the, the study of the, Holy, the, the gifts of the Spirit. It's by Brother Hagen. See Will after church. He can tell you that. I can't think of the name of it right now. But it breaks down every one of these gifts, and he gives you examples biblically. It is a wonderful study guide that he probably wrote back in the 70s or something. But it would benefit you. I know it's old school, but it will help you. Now listen to this real quickly. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another the faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, by the same Spirit, by the same Spirit. To another working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, and to another interpretation of tongues. Now what I want to do, I want to show you this just for study purposes. But there are three different categories of these gifts that I want to highlight for you. So just hang tight. We'll make this stuff available for you. you can, I'm sure Amanda will put it out so you can get these and go back and study it out. <clears throat> but the first ones I want you to see are the revelation gifts, which are word of wisdom, word of knowledge, discerning of spirits. Now let me take a second. Once again, I, 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 please understand me, I am not slamming a certain new translation. I love New Living. I read it all the time. It is a wonderful, it flows very well, easy to read. But it's a paraphrase, Jack. I know they call it a translation. I do not agree with that. It is a paraphrase. Because in this passage, when, when they highlight word of wisdom, that word there is the word rhema. It is the revelation of wisdom supernaturally to an individual about something going on in their life that they're going to have to deal with. The New Living says God will give you, I think it says supernatural wisdom or great wisdom. I'm, no, that's not what the Bible says. That's not it. Not to, it's a word. Say word. It is a manifest, a revelation word. It's a rhema word. Word of knowledge, same thing. It's not supernatural knowledge. It's spiritual. And it's about something going on for you in a circumstance, in a situation, a revelation from the Spirit. Let me give you an example of this. The day I gave my life to Christ, I walked into this church, and this guy walks up to me, and he got a word of knowledge. He said, the Spirit of the Lord just spoke to me and said, you came today to give your life to Jesus. Well, I laughed at him, but he just got a, that was the Holy Spirit. He just got a word of knowledge. He said, you're going to give your life to Christ today. Yeah. Well, I laughed at him. He, I thought, hey, that's a joke. Guess what? I was the first one to the altar at the end. The Lord showed him that was a, that was a manifest. He doesn't walk around giving out words of knowledge to people. The Lord prompted him, said, speak this to this young man. That's how it works. It is always for the advancement of the body of Christ. So the revelation gifts are word of wisdom, word of knowledge, and then discerning of spirits. These all reveal something. Now, discerning of spirits, 
I, I got I to pick my pace up a little bit, so stay with me. It didn't say discerning of demons. Most people that say, I got this, they think they specialize in seeing demons. That's not what that says. Discerning of spirits is spiritual realities. See, that was the thing. He, was, he, he actually flowed in both. both of, they overcrossed sometimes. He actually had a discerning that day. He probably was flowing in both of these at the same time. He, he, because he had this discerning. Well, you're not born again, and you came to. They will flow together. We don't, don't try to isolate these things. I got the discerning of spirits. You got a demon. No, you're confused. You might be the one with the demon. You don't need a discerning of spirits for demons. If you show up anointed, read the Bible. I know some of you don't agree with this. Okay, prove me wrong. I love you. But every time, listen to me, every time Jesus, Peter, and the Apostle Paul showed up, there was no discerning needed. The demon manifested. He can't stand the anointing because he is defeated. And when that presence of God gets there, Those are revelation gifts. The next two, gift of faith, working of miracles, gifts of healings, plural healings. Now, the gift of faith is not human faith that you have when God made you. Every human is made with faith. Otherwise, there's no way you could function. I mean, you use faith to sit in that chair, believing it would hold you. You use human, natural human faith when you drive down 25 and there's another car coming back at you at, okay, probably 50, 55, yeah. You, you, that's natural human faith. You, you have faith. You trust in the fact he's going to stay on his side. But then there is also the Romans chapter 4, the Romans chapter 10 faith. That faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And Abraham grew stronger in his faith. That's spiritual faith for the born again that you can operate in. But then there is the gift of faith. See, the gift of faith is this supernatural ability to believe and receive something from God. Can I give you an example of this? I said I was going to hurry up. I'm not, on it. But you need, you need to get this because we confuse these things. And they're, they're different than your general operating spiritual realities that you have. See, the gift of faith, for example, the three Hebrew boys, the gift of faith manifested in their life. They're standing in front of Nebuchadnezzar, and, he, and they, they said, O king, whether you throw us in the fire or you don't, gift of faith in operation, our God will deliver us. What happened? Fourth man in the fire, come out, didn't smell like smoke. Those are, mir- those are miraculous things that the Holy Spirit will manifest. Those are power gifts, working of miracles, gifts of healings. You don't have to conjure these up. When they're flowing, when the Holy Spirit is manifesting, there's no confusion. You will know. Lord, I wonder if that's you. Not when it's a gift of the Holy Spirit, you won't. You'll know. He's not confusing. Matter of fact, in chapter 14, Bob, Paul actually sums up his whole teaching on this. He says, guys, just so you know, God is not the author of confusion. All right? And then the last three are utterance gifts, which are prophecy, diversity of, of tongues, and interpretations of tongues. And all of these are manifestations of gifts that will flow in the church. Let me give you one quick example, and then I'll move on. But I can't remember the church and what year it was or even the country the gentleman was from, but he was from a foreign country, and it was some kind of Arabic dialect that he spoke. And him and his family showed up in this church, and this is back in the 50s. And Brother Hagin's preaching, and right during Brother Hagin's sermon, the Lord drops the gift of tongues in him, and he, get, he begins to speak in tongues. And as soon as he does, the gentleman and his family in the back, they perk up. Because they hear their language. And they all give their lives to Jesus. And then Brother Hagin was done. Huh? Remember Acts chapter 2? They all came out speaking in the Holy Spirit in other tongues. and diff- I mean, they list like 12 different nations. And they all heard them glorifying God in their own language. That's a gift. That's a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. See, what every believer has to be open to is if the Holy Spirit told us to desire these, what's up? See, at some point, we got to be willing to yield to his manifestation. And it only comes by practice. See, the reason that Paul and some of these guys were able to yield to some of these things is because they, they were practicing these things. They were earnestly desiring them. 
Yeah, but what if we earnestly desire them and we mess up? Oh, you mean like the Corinthian church was? Yeah, you mean like a bunch of old school Pentecostal churches did? Yeah, they do. See, that's the thing, that, that the reason so many people, it's a shame that the church is so, what's the word I'm looking for, really? Just insensitive to other people. Because if, if you don't think like we do, if you don't sing the right song, if you don't, oh, oh you, don't, you don't do that during your service? Oh. It's, it's amazing how effective the enemy is being from within the body of Christ. Yeah. You have to desire these. But so often the Pentecostal church over history has been mocked and laughed at just like Acts chapter 2 because they're willing to step out and search for and experience things and they don't do it right. And it looks all goofy and weird. How many of y'all remember the first time your, your, your first child walked? Quit that right now. You look stupid. No, you, you, actually, you actually start talking in tongues, don't you? <laughs> you, 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 you? Yeah, you do. Because you're all excited that they're getting ready to discover something new. That's how our Father is. Regardless of what the world does. Remember, guys, the Holy Spirit empowers, not overpowers. Something else, you know, like I said, you got to keep in mind, as you begin to step into these things, be sensitive and humble. Sometimes they'll flow together, they'll overlap, but never try to manufacture these things. Remember what verse 11 says? One in the same spirit works all of these together, distributing to each one individually as the Holy Spirit wills. Now that being said, this doesn't mean that a believer can't operate in the general realities of the spirit. What, what do you mean? I mean, there is healing today by faith. There is prophecy today by faith. There is tongues and interpretations today by faith that you can do in your private time and in a general setting. That's what Paul is dealing with in chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians. Now remember, there's no chapters and verses. 12, 13, and 14. Remember, God put 12 and 14. He put 13 as like... They were telling my staff talking about peanut butter and jelly, right, right between two pieces of bread. Yeah. Love is the key to this, you all. Remember what Paul said in verse one: pursue love, desire spiritual gifts. I just wonder how many of you all desire spiritual gifts. I've been, I've been pushing into this a little more. We were, we were praying the other day as a staff, and and you know, and it happened a couple Wednesday nights ago on a prayer night. But I'm endeavoring to give my staff examples of what it looks like, of tongues and interpretations. And I had a word for the church. I had a word for Paula one day. Well, did you just make that happen? No. I said, Holy Spirit, I'm going to yield to this. Because he said, be an example. Well, I'm going to, you know, as a leader, you know, sometimes a leader has to do what? Go first. <laughs> and that means you might look a little dumb. You know what else? You just might miss it. Yeah, pursue love. That's why that's first. Des desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you prophesy. This is why we have to keep this out in front of us, you all. As we move into a closer walk, you got to get this. As you move into a closer walk with Jesus, into some deeper revelation of the things of the kingdom, a more clarified calling. I cannot overemphasize this enough. enough. The love of God is, is, is at the center of everything God does. See, if you're being critical and judgmental of something or somebody or what they're doing, you're not walking in love. Earnestly, look at, look at Paul's, look, look at it, verse 31. Earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. What's that excellent way, Paul? That excellent way is love. <clears throat> and regardless of where you're at in your, your walk today, here's God's rule when it comes to any truth in the Bible, any truth about spiritual things. Here's God's rule. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Though, this is Paul writing, verse 1. Y'all okay? Hang with me just a little bit, all right? Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. What's that all about? There's tongues of angels? Well, according to the Holy Spirit, there's tongues of angels. And Paul says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but I don't have love, I'm just a clanging symbol. See, you may have all this stuff going on, but if you're not doing it in love, you're just making a bunch of noise. 
And when it comes to this subject, it's important that we remember that God put chapter 14 there to, to help us. To, to, and he told us, he said, guys, I'm not a God of confusion. So all you have to do, the, the reason there's so much confusion is that you, we just don't talk about it. Huh? And let me encourage you with something. Don't be using Google and YouTube as your source of information. They love to mock this kind of stuff. They are ignorant. They are of their father, the devil. Don't use that stuff to research spiritual things. God put pastors in churches for a reason. If you want to research, call me. Well, I don't agree with you. Then go find you one that will help you. Is that complaining enough for you? I love you, but listen, we're living in a time in history. Church played games way too long with this stuff, you all. Okay? Something that, you, that we have as a church has put in practice here is this. We, we've decided that we are going to use the term spiritual language simply because it doesn't come with all the religious baggage of speaking in tongues. Because I can tell you in this county, tongue talkers, well, baggage. And I get it to some degree because, once again, it comes back on, on my shoulders due to lack of teaching on the subject, false teaching on the subject, religious, tra religious traditions, opinions, unbelief, fear, lack of experience. Many people have concluded that stuff like this, it's not necessary today. Not necessary. You think about this. When God launched the church on the planet, please get this his very first thing he did was anoint their speech first thing he did was anoint their speech not for today that's called a, that's called a religious cop out see if you're born again you have got to be open to embracing your new creation you are a new species of being you literally are a speaking spirit <laughs> Is that a reality in your world today? Yet you're still confined to humanity. Listen to Jesus' words in John 6. He says, guys, remember, my words, they are spirit. And they are truth. You think about it for a second. At the end of the day, it's just like any other reality that we get from God. we got to believe this stuff. And the overwhelming majority of things that we read and learn about when it comes to the subject of spiritual language, it all comes from, the, the bulk of it comes from the Apostle Paul in his writings to the New Testament, New Testament, to the New Testament church. New Testament church. Yeah, it hadn't changed. Still the same one in Acts 2, Acts 10, Acts 19. Same church, you all. You think about Paul, though, this guy. He was probably one of the smartest people that Jesus ever encountered and used in the body of Christ. He studied under the, under the uh, tutorship of Gamaliel. He went to one of the most elite universities of his day. Very intellect. He graduated from that school as an elite Pharisee. Paul is one of history's most respected and quoted thinkers. To this day, the Apostle Paul is. And he is second only to Jesus in establishing the church globally. And this dude, in his letter to the New Testament church, in chapter 14, verse 18, says this, I thank God, I speak in tongues more than all of you. If you just had that one scripture, what you do? Because what's really sad is all the people that, all the, I'm talking about elders and theologians and scholars that write books on why it's not for today, Lord, I pray mercy on them because they're going to have to answer for that one day. But all of them that say it's not for today and it went away and all those dumb, traditional, unbelieving opinions that they write and theories, they'll quote Paul with everything else they teach. They'll use all of his other writings, all of his other teachings. They'll quote all of them. But chapter 14, not for today. You think about this if Jesus said stuff like everything's possible to him that believes would that include this particular subject 
Right? The same Holy Spirit, guys, that empowered the church at its birth, still here. As a matter of fact, outside the prophet Isaiah, who was the first one to introduce speaking in tongues in the Old Testament, Jesus is the first one to introduce it in the New Testament. In Mark chapter 16, Jesus actually said, these signs will follow them that believe. They will learn Spanish, French. No, they'll speak in other tongues. See, and after God introduces this spiritual reality to his church, there is not one, not one, and if you don't believe me, please go study this out. And if you have questions, call me. Not one scripture that says God changed. God took it away. It was just for a season. See, spiritual language, God, it's just as scriptural as John 3, 16. I mean, Paul dedicated a whole chapter to it. It's just as scriptural as John or uh, Romans 10, 13. Huh? Whoever calls on the name of the Lord. Well, I don't know about that one. I mean, Paul said that one too, so, I mean, he could have been wrong on that one too, right? See how ridiculous this stuff is? The, the, the religious spirit is so cunning and deceptive. He's a master at deceiving people. And what, give me two minutes. Y'all okay? All right. After the birth of the church, some 10 years later, you all remember Paul's experience on the road to Damascus? The Holy Spirit smacks him and knocks him off of his horse because he was coming against the church. And, the, and, and you understand, Paul's a Pharisee, so he knows the word better than anybody. And then when he comes to and realizes what's going on, his first words is, Lord. You don't, you don't call him Lord unless you just got a revelation. And, you know, now, and he said, Paul, why are you persecuting me? Who was Paul persecuting? people. Jesus took it personal. Jesus hadn't changed. When people come against the church today, same thing. He don't like that, right? And then Acts chapter 9, God goes and taps Ananias, just a regular disciple on the shoulder. He's minding his own business, praying in the Holy Spirit, and, uh, and, the, Holy, and the Holy Ghost comes to Ananias. There's this guy, Saul, and he says, wait, 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 you talking about Saul? The terrorist Saul? You want me to go to his house? No, I'm sending him to you, Ananias. Watch this. And Ananias went his way. He entered the house, laying his hands on him. He called him Brother Saul. What's that mean? What's brother mean? Born again. He's already born again. I know a lot of people try to put all this in one basket. No. Nope. He says, the Lord Jesus appeared to me on appeared to you on the road as you came, and he sent me that you may receive your sight, because the Lord struck him blind and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now this terminology, filled with the Holy Spirit, I know people struggle with that, and they're like, well, that's really not, it doesn't mean tongues all the time. Go read the book of Acts. Go read, the, I, I know it doesn't say here that Paul talked in tongues. I just quoted chapter 14 to you. I talk in tongues more than all of you. So when did it happen? It happened when Ananias laid his hands on him and he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Sometimes you just need to use some common sense when you read the Bible. Acts chapter 10, while Peter was still preaching, the Holy Spirit fell on all of them at Cornelius' house. And the Bible says that all who heard it spoke in tongues and magnified God. 20 years later, say 20 years. 20 years later, in Acts chapter 19, Paul is in Ephesus. I talked about this one last week. He said, well, then what were you baptized in? We was baptized in John's baptism. Then Paul said, no, you got to get it this way. He baptized me in the name of Jesus. Then he laid hands on him, and they all spoke in tongues and prophesied. See, you understand, guys, the Corinthian letters, Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, Peter's letters, all of those took place in the book of Acts. There is no beginning of church. In the, no, no, no. It all took place in that book. Still, it's still unfolded. That's right, Jack. Paul says this in chapter 2. Or chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, pursue love to desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy for he who speaks in a tongue. Wait, 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 wait. What? What happened here? He, he said, he, he said, you know, you can prophesy, and then he goes right into, and he who speaks in a tongue doesn't speak to men but to God. He who speaks in a tongue doesn't speak to men but to God. He who speaks in a tongue doesn't speak to men but to God. 
Why? Because no one understands him. But in the spirit, he speaks out mysteries. A better, a better understanding of it is divine, God-inspired secrets. There are things that I have prayed out that concern this church that we're walking in today that I was praying in in tongues years ago. See, when I don't know what to pray, that's where I go. See, tongues, let me, real quickly, some, some purposes of tongues. Number one, personal praise and worship. This is, your, this is your personal prayer time. See, Paul differentiates the two. Self-edification. Remember Jude 20, building yourself up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit? Well, pastor, it doesn't say tongues. Go back and read the book of Acts. When you see that quote, praying in the Holy Spirit, what do you think it means? Now, can you pray in your known language in the Holy Spirit? You can, but that's inspired as well. That's why prophecy and tongues and interpretations are equivalent. In a, in, a, in a corporate setting, in public, if you're going to give a tongue, you better give the interpretation. Yeah? Tongues are for self-edification. Tongues are praying out those divine secrets, and it is also for public exhortation. Listen to Paul's words in 14.4. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. He who prophesies edifies the church. Watch this. I will... If it's not for today, Jaden, why would Paul say dumb stuff like this? I wish all of you spoke in tongues. Yeah, but what if it's not God's will, Paul? Well, I'm, I'm not care. I don't care what, what, what the Lord's want. I'm telling y'all. I wish all of you spoke in tongues, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks in a tongue, unless indeed he interprets. Huh? Who interprets? The one who spoke. I learned this years ago. If you're going to give the tongue in public, you better know what the interpretation is before you give it. Or, watch it. He says you do this so that the church may be edified. If you, if you don't have both, then keep it to yourself. See, Paul is just differentiating the two for us. He's distinguishing public use and private use of spiritual language. I got I to gotta let you go. You got to let me go. Watch this. My last one, I promise. <clears throat> Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. He didn't say pray that you get an interpreter. Read it again. Let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. That, what's that mean? That means you can. For if I pray, who? What, what, what do you mean if? It's the spirit that it's the spirit on me. No, no, Paul says if I pray. He's not talking about giving the tongue publicly now. He said if I pray in a tongue my spirit prays but my understanding is unfruitful you got me listen very carefully to the wording verse 15 so what's the conclusion y'all church at Corinth you bunch of charismaniacs what's your conclusion say I will this is key not the Holy Spirit manifesting on me I will Paul says I will that's his will not the will of the Lord I will pray in the spirit I will hmm? sing in the Spirit. I will also pray with my understanding and sing with my understanding. I will. Otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit, how will him who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen? Even though you did it well, nobody knew what you were saying when you do it publicly. Y'all getting this? So when it comes to this subject, <clears throat> Paul makes it very clear that spiritual language is simply the born again praying from their spirit. And if you're in this room today and you don't do it, my, my first encouragement to you is to put things in neutral. Remember, he said to desire these things. Right? And I know you've been taught all kinds of different stuff. Be humble enough to be teachable. Don't think you've concluded that you're right. Yeah, but who? Yeah, but my great grandfather, my they, they taught me, and I love them. We're not taking any respect or dishonoring them in any way. That doesn't mean they couldn't be wrong, huh? We are human. We operate in these broken, fallen vessels. Go check it out. Anybody that really is desiring this, when you get before the Lord, He will honor your faith. But now you got to be willing to step out and try it and sound absolutely ridiculous. I was telling my team the other day, 
To this day, the enemy doesn't stop with this. I'll, I'll have a tongue, I'll, I'll speak something, and right away, well, that's ridiculous. Right away. I've been doing this for, since I've been born again, 1992. I'm a, I'm a tongue talker from day one. And he still tries, he's so ignorant, he still tries the same tactic. That's ridiculous. That's not for today. You're just making up gibberish in your head. Shut up. And then I just let it rip. Huh? But that's how he works. So for you today, if you want this, it is available. God doesn't play games with this thing. We're not going to embarrass anybody. We're not going to ask you to stand up, come down front, oh, you know, give a tongue. No, 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 no. If you want it, ask for it. And in your prayer closet, by yourself, you watch. It'll come to you, and then you'll fight it with your intelligence. Oh, no, that's not it. That sounds ridiculous. You know, I've heard people speak in foreign languages. I'm like, man, that sounds ridiculous. You ever heard foreign languages? Other than the ones you're used to? They sound, they don't, you know. The enemy's going to fight you with this. But I'm telling you, as you begin to grow in it, and I talk to people in our church that are growing in this all the time, and it's a beautiful thing. I cannot tell you the stories I've had people will call me, like, because I tell them to do this very thing, and then I get a phone call. Pastor, they're like a little kid. Pastor, I got it. Huh? I got it. Yeah. But you have to start. This thing, it belongs to the people of God. So if you're in the room today and you're not, if you don't belong to God, well, let's take care of that first. And then the Holy Spirit will help you in this subject. And if you need help, call us, man. Call us. Okay? You got that? But step one, give your life to Jesus. And if you're here, maybe you're listening or watching, let's do this together, all right? We got a very simple prayer. Say it with us as a congregation. Give the Lord a chance in your life. Let's go. Holy Spirit, no, my bad. Wait a minute. I was getting ready to do the other one. <laughs> Y'all ain't ready. We're going to get you born again first, okay? <laughs> See how he'll help you? He caught me right there. Let, let, let's try it. Lord Jesus, <laughs> come into my life and make me new. And from this day forward, Jesus is my Lord. Heaven is my home. And I will never be the same in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you're in the room and you said the prayer, stop by our information desk. Let somebody know. Now, for those of you that want your prayer language, speaking spiritually in an unknown tongue, simply ask the Lord. Not, I'm not, not me, you. You ask the Lord for this, and then when you get by yourself, let me, thank you, Lord. Take 1 Corinthians chapter 14 with you. Set up camp there for a season. And you watch. Some of you, it's going to flow like a river. Remember Jesus said, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. Other you, others, it's going to sound like a baby. Just a couple little, you know. Don't worry about that. You have to start. Amen? So make today the day that you start experiencing, not that you're more spiritual than someone else, not that you're more saved than someone else. This is a gift that he's allowed for us to experience him at a higher level. That's all it is. Amen? So step out and try this today. We love you all. God bless you. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please be sure to click on the subscribe button. For more information on Victory Life Church, check us out at victorylifeky.com. Thank you so much for listening.